Jesus had appeared to his disciples and to the women that Sunday morning and then on the road to Emmaus by two disciples. Then that evening he appeared to 10 of them. Thomas wasn't there. Then eight days later, Jesus appeared to the 11 along with Thomas. And Thomas makes his confession, my Lord and my God. He had told them and the angels had told the women to tell the disciples that they were to meet in Galilee. But now finally they're in Galilee. And in John 21, we take up the narrative of the post-resurrection appearances by Jesus. And so it says, after these things, Jesus manifested or made himself plain, himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, the Sea of Tiberias has a lot of different names. It depends on where you're located at the time. Um, you know it more commonly as the Sea of Galilee. I also find it interesting that we call it the Sea of Whatever. Because in our connotation, when you think of sea, you think of salt water. And when you think of fresh water, you think of a lake. Well, the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake, if you will. So they're there in Galilee by the sea. And Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two others of his disciples were together. So we've got seven of the 11 disciples gathered together by the Sea of Galilee, um, ready to, to meet Jesus at the designated place where we'll see that in the coming weeks, uh, the designation where they were to meet him. Now, it tells us, of five of the seven disciples' names, but it doesn't tell us two others. I think one of the reasons that it specifically mentions several is one, obviously Simon is the actor in, in this group. Um, Thomas was the one who had his great refusal to acknowledge that Jesus could even possibly raise from the dead. And I think Nathaniel is mentioned because it says of Canaan. And I will mention later why I think that's significant. It's to call us to remembrance of something. And so there's these seven disciples who are now all together by the Sea of Galilee. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Notice he didn't say, do you guys want to go fishing? He says, I'm going. Now, some might criticize Peter, because, well, why are you going fishing when you're supposed to be eventually meeting Jesus or whatever? I think because Peter's one of those guys who's like a lot of guys. He just doesn't want to sit around. He is a fisherman by trade. That's his vocation. And so rather than just sitting around and waiting, he's going to do something. And what he does is let's be productive. Let's go out and fish because that's what I am, a fisherman. And, but he doesn't say, well, let's take it up to for a boat. He goes, there's six of you can do whatever you want. I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll also come with you. So they go, well, it's, he's sitting around here waiting. So we'll go with you and go fishing. Now, not all these guys are fishermen, but several of them were partners with, Saint, uh, with Peter and others uh, were also fishermen. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night... They caught nothing. They were busy. They were fishing. They put out their nets. They were doing, but they didn't accomplish anything. They didn't catch any fish. And a lot of times we are busy, but we accomplish nothing. And we think because we're busy that that's important. But just because you're busy and don't accomplish something you still catch nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet his disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So it's just now sunrise. 
Jesus is already there on the beach. They don't recognize him. He's just some lone figure standing on the shore. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? I, I find this interesting in, in, in two, two veins. One, he calls them children. Now, I don't think he's saying that in the sense of res- disrespect, in the sense of that they're lowly or something. I think what he's saying is that we have a family relationship. We have a familial relationship. I am responsible for you. And that you are considered my children. And so he asked them, you haven't caught any fish, have you? Now, Jesus somewhat modifies it, but the question I always hate, I hate the question phrased this way. There were those, and I won't say who, there were those who used to ask me the question always in the negative. So for instance, uh, let's say somebody asked me to go get a loaf of bread. The question was always, you didn't get the loaf of bread, did you? I'm always going, why did you assume I didn't do it? You should just ask me in the kind of in the neutral. Did you go get the loaf of bread? And so Jesus kind of phrases this in the negative. You haven't caught any fish, have you? But he knew they hadn't caught any fish. But he did give them a chance to say, well, maybe you did. And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast a net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. Now, those of you who know anything about Jesus know that he was raised by a carpenter, not a fisherman. Yet he knows better than the fisherman, not because he's a fisherman, but because he's God. And he knows or will place the fish exactly where he tells them to put the net. For their sake, he didn't make them go any further. He simply said, drop the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. At Jesus' instructions, at one cast, they were able to catch more fish than they were able to haul in their, their net, even though all night they worked hard and caught nothing. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John's way of saying it's me. I'm writing this gospel. John says to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, why would John say that it's the Lord? Because there was a time at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry that he went on a seashore and had been teaching people from some boats as he sat and taught after they had worked all night and had caught nothing. So he then tells Peter, take the boat out and you will catch some fish. And Jesus and Peter's response to Jesus was, Lord, we worked all night. But at your instruction, we'll do it. And they did, and they caught so many fish, they couldn't haul them all in. And Peter's response was, depart from me. I'm not worthy to be in the presence of you. All of a sudden, these disciples realized that the person who had been teaching and who had instructed them previously some almost three and a half years earlier how to catch some fish. And at that time, he said, I am going to make you fishers of men or catchers of men. And Jesus is reemphasizing that this statement by saying, 
I give you instructions and you will catch. You work hard without me and you will accomplish nothing. This works in the physical realm and this will work in the spiritual realm. Jesus is saying, if you are going to be fishers of men, then you need to follow my teaching, my instruction. And then you will be successful in catching people. Today, there are a lot of people and a lot of churches you would think are very successful. Because there's a lot of people going there. But they don't teach what Jesus teaches. They may be tickling ears and they may be pseudo catching, but it will be for naught because they have not sealed their hearts in eternity. But by following Jesus' instructions, they truly become fishers of men. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, Peter does something that the opposite of what most of us would do. Most of us, when we're going to go swimming, either put on a bathing suit or continue wearing what we're wearing. But notice what it says. He put his outer garment on or he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. See, most would say, well, he's going swimming. He's going to get wet. So he needs to stay the way he is so that his outer garment won't be wet. But Peter knows it's the Lord. And you don't appear before the Lord dressed the way he's dressed. So he at least puts on his outer garment so that he might approach the Lord. And yes, it's true, as the song says, just as I am, without one plea, that your blood died, you died for me. Yes, Jesus calls us just as we are, but he doesn't leave us that way. So he throws himself into the sea so that he might swim that hundred yards to Jesus. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. Now, these guys are practical. We worked all night long, caught nothing. Now we got a net full of fish. We're not going to leave them there. We're going to take them into the shore. But Peter, in his enthusiasm, wants to be present with the Lord right away. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. I want to stop there. Notice this is before they got there. Jesus already had fish. Jesus already had bread. He had already prepared breakfast for them. But notice it said there was a charcoal fire. Now, unfortunately for you and I, we have our gas grills and whatever, and so we don't do much charcoaling. But if we do, we go and we get a bag of charcoal, and we dump it in the barbecue, and we get the lighter fluid, and then we light it and whatever. But there is a process to make charcoal. The real quick process is you take some wood, you put it on fire, and then you limit the oxygen that is in that fire. And it takes a process of many hours to create charcoal. Jesus created a charcoal fire. The reason why I think that we are told Nathaniel of Canaan is there is because the very first miracle that Jesus performed was the turning of water into wine, something that took aging. So Jesus in his first miracle says, I am the creator. He who can take what is and create what is, even though it may need aging, because I created the world by just speaking. And so we are reminded that God can speak and do. And therefore, the charcoal, which would require a period of time to create, 
Jesus can because he's the Lord of creation. So in this little simple statement, we are reminded that Jesus is Lord, that he's creator. And he has his charcoal fire already. And he's got the fish. He's got the bread. And then Jesus says something interesting. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Jesus didn't ask them to bring the fish because he didn't have enough. Jesus could have done whatever Jesus needed to do and had more than enough. And I believe that there were more than enough fish and bread there already on this charcoal fire to feed all of them. So why did Jesus ask them to do so? Because he says, I want you to participate with me. Just as we are to be called fishers of people. It is Jesus and his spirit that draws everyone to himself. And we do not have the responsibility to save anybody. Because we can't. It is the Holy Spirit who draws people to himself. Our job, our participation is to be witnesses of his. And in being witnesses of him, that we then might participate in that. So Jesus has asked us to participate, but he doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. He wants us to participate. And so he says, bring some of your fish and put it on the fire. The other thing I want to to mention here is that during the three and a half years of ministry of Jesus, he kept telling his disciples and those who would listen that he came not to be served, but to serve. And now he has raised from the dead. It is now abundantly clear that he is the Lord of all, that he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And yet he has not changed his teaching. As a matter of fact, he is demonstrating this teaching because he is preparing and serving breakfast to the disciples. Or you and I would expect Well, if I'm the big hot shot, then you're supposed to fix everything for me, lay it at my feet, and I'll tell you if it's good or not. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus continues to serve even after his resurrection. I was listening to a a, a Christian song the other day, and I'm not criticizing the song, and then I've heard other Christian songs, so it's a, it's accumulation of all these Christian songs. But it talks about how we want to be more like Jesus. And usually it's that we want to be more loving, we want to be more forgiving, we want to be more patient, we want to be all these different things. And all of those things are good. I'm not saying we shouldn't be more loving, I shouldn't, we shouldn't be more kind, we shouldn't be more forgiving. All of those things are good. I never hear anybody sing or say, I need to serve more. I need to be more of a servant. As we're so concerned about our rights and our standing, and yet Jesus, who is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who rose from the dead, is still serving his disciples. And if Jesus, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who is raised from the dead, who is God, serves even after the resurrection. And if we are his followers, then we need to be serving. We need to be loving. We need to be more kind. We need to be more forgiving. We need to be all of those things. But as much as we need to be all of those things, we need to be more of service to others. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land, full of large fish, 
153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. First off, the scriptures on that this was a miraculous catch. They worked all night, caught nothing. Now there's so many fish, and in numbers 153, there were so many, but yet the nets didn't tear. Jesus says, when you are fishers of men, your nets will not tear. And it's interesting when you read the various commentaries and they'll agree or disagree and argue and back and forth. What does the 153 fish mean? And you'll say, some will say, well, there's 153 known nations at the time. And other people will say there was 153 different kinds of fish. And there's all these statements of what the 153 stands for. Let me give you a little secret. You want to know what the 153 stand for? 153 fish. There were literally 153 fish in the net. You don't need symbolism. What you need is the fact that however big your net is, there's going to be more fish than you're able to catch, and it won't tear. But pastor, my witness is so little. So you have a little net. So you catch a couple of fish, but your net won't tear. Or maybe you have great capacity and you have all kinds of awesome charisma and people just want to listen to you and you have a really big net. And even in that really big net, it won't tear. Every fish meant to be caught will be caught. Don't worry about your net. Don't worry about your ministry. Simply do his instruction. Place the net where God told you to place the net. Well, where does he tell me to place the net? Where are you living? We all love the idea of missionaries. And God, praise God that we have missionaries. And praise God that they have this on their heart to go to all these lands and whatever. But Jesus didn't say, I've called some of you to be missionaries, and the rest of you can hang out until I come back. He says, you shall be my witnesses. You shall be fishers of people for me. Therefore, cast your net where you are. I heard someone say, and I've said it several times, you want to be a missionary? Go next door and knock on the door. It doesn't, cause, it doesn't mean you have to raise any money. And you probably never met them anyway. Because we in Southern California never meet. We have friends all over the Southern California area. But most of us don't know our next door neighbor. So, but you know, Pastor, if I go, they might reject me. Here's another secret. You didn't know them anyway. So what did you lose? Non-friendship from a non-person you didn't know? But what might you gain? Their eternal salvation and the thrill in your soul of knowing that you were a fisher of people and that you cast your net the way Jesus told you to. A simple narrative that Jesus said. Verse 12, it says this, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. So finally, they've kind of figured it out, both by his teaching and by his actions and by his presence, that he is the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Again, Jesus not only fixed breakfast, he served breakfast. 
well, I'll do this much, but no more. Not the example of Jesus. Jesus prepared breakfast and served breakfast. He gave them the bread. He gave them the fish. He says, this is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. You see, Jesus has shown himself in Jerusalem, shown himself in the garden. He has shown himself on the road to Emmaus. He's shown himself to Peter. He's shown himself to the 10 in the upper room. He showed, or in the locked room, he showed himself to the 11 eight days later. And now this third time to the entire group, he has shown himself to be who he is. Not a spirit, not a ghost, one who prepares breakfast, one who has the ability to create a charcoal fire and serve bread and fish, having not received any from those who were trying to catch them. So oftentimes when we read the scripture, we wish if I could only have been there. If I could have been when I saw those fry bones raising resurrected in the flesh and a new army created. I could have been there with Elijah and the servant when he says, there are more with us than who are against us. If we could have been there when David said, what are you guys doing? These uncircumcised heathens are mark- mocking our God. How dare you stand and take it? Me as a little Grimp of a guy will go out and take on the giant. Oh, would it have been awesome to see it? Would not have been so awesome to see Jesus die on the cross. But how awesome must it have been to see his resurrected body? How awesome must it have been for Paul, so many years later, to be knocked off of his horse? in the presence of the Lord. No, we weren't at any of those days. But we are in the days of Elijah. We are in the days of David. We are in the days where people will mock and scorn and ridicule. But we are in the days that there is a field of white of harvest. And that we are to be sent out to be reapers of people, to be fishers of people, to catch. Not because we are fantastic, not because that we have the ability to do so, but because he has called us to participate in his ministry. And one last word about that. We are so results-oriented. And so we take it upon ourselves because we're results-oriented. But Lord, I've tried to witness and no one responds. Or Lord, I've, I've taught Bible study and no one seems to get it. Or Lord, you know, I sing and nothing seems to happen. Or Lord, I pray and no response seems to be. Freedom is, again, it's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is be faithful to his word. Be faithful to him. There was a, a chorus a long time ago that said, if just a cup of water is all he's given you, then just a cup of water is all that he demands. The Lord knows your intention. He's not looking for results. 
He's looking for you. I'm subject to the same disappointments as anyone else. Lord, I wish we had a larger congregation. Lord, I wish that we had a larger group of people who listen to us on the various social ministries that we have. Well, apparently if he wanted that, he'd have called somebody else. He's called me here to be faithful and he's called you here to be faithful and he's called you to work the fields here. And he's called me to work the fields somewhere here. Now there may be a dime that he'll ask you to go to Uganda or Afghanistan or Russia or to come carry. I don't know where he'll send you. But until he sends you there, he's called you to be here. I used to say, and I'll say it again. One of your jobs is to say, God bless FBC West. And if he calls you home, you still have a job. You're closer to him to say, Lord, bless FBC West. One last song that I'm going to mention. There's a song that says, which we all kind of say that as long as I'm breathing, you're not done with me. And so I praise you. Here's a little secret. When we stop breathing, we're going to praise him more. Because we will see him as he is. Now we see darkly. Now we, now we kind of see, but, but circumstances just kind of blinds our eyes sometimes. But when we stop breathing, he will see us and we will see him just as he is. So there's not any stopping of praising him. These are not the good old days. These are not the new bad days. These are simply the days he has called you to be here, to be his witnesses in these days. And all God's people said, <laughs>